Right now, what I'd like to do, as you know, the Center for Women in Politics and Public Policy is at the University of Massachusetts, Boston, and we have a wonderful chancellor, Chancellor Joanne Gora, who is going to greet you for the university and in a way that we were not able to really hear last night when she did a, a small greeting. She's going to comment on some aspects of women in politics that are uh, somewhat um, uh, different from perhaps the, some of the elected official politics that we've been talking a lot about today. I'd like to mention that Chancellor Gora is, has been at the university for two years now and presides over an institution with 13,000 students. She's one of the very few uh, women presidents, chancellors of major universities. And she also has a Ph.D. in uh, sociology from Rutgers uh, University, as well as a master's degree. And her specialty is uh, criminology, and I believe that that makes some links between her and the, um, the lieutenant governor, who also has similar credentials that uh, the chancellor will talk to you about. But we are very thrilled to welcome a strong supporter of our Center for Women in Politics and Public Policy. We would not be able to do this summit without the support of the university. Many of the things that you've received in terms of materials, um, the opportunity to do this summit, we, the communications, uh, so many aspects of this summit were made possible really directly from the university. And I want to welcome Chancellor Joanne Gora as a very strong supporter of women's issues. Thank you, Carol. And thank you, Carol, for the leadership that you have brought to the New England Women's Political Summit. You gave voice to the concept and together with an outstanding organizing committee have really worked tirelessly to make this concept a reality. So you and your committee are to be congratulated for your efforts. You've really made a difference here. I know you've had a great morning, and uh, the good news is there's even more to come. I'm delighted to see so many of you here today and to welcome you on behalf of the University of Massachusetts at Boston. As we heard this morning, we have much work ahead of us to achieve our goal of substantially increasing the numbers of women in elected political office. We must identify and recruit these future women leaders, and we must encourage them to run. We must help potential women candidates recognize what they have to offer, and we must also help them believe that they can win. This was a strong message this morning, but it was also the strong message that we heard last night from Loretta Sanchez and from former Governor Swift as they talked about the need to encourage and support women and to really be behind them every step of the way. We must support them with our time, with our talents, and with our checkbooks, and we must ensure that women receive the education and the mentoring that they need to be both winning candidates and successful office holders. We need to ch challenge the stereotypes that have kept women out of the political arena, and we must change the political climate. There are no women's issues. Family issues affect all of us, whether we are male or female. And the same is true for the economy, for fo foreign policy, for public safety, among others. Issues do not have gender, and women candidates should not be handicapped by theirs. All of us here today are change agents. We have a great responsibility to our respective states and to our country to ensure that women are in leadership positions at every level of government. And we can make that happen. The United States has more, has a history um, of, of supporting education and has a history of being the, the founding of the women's movement. And yet the number of women who are in elected political office in this country is really small compared to other countries. We actually ranked 52 um, in terms of the number of women in our national legislature when compared with other countries. Um, of the 12,000 people who have held cabinet positions since the start of this country, only 215 of them have been women. And at this time, only six women are CEOs of Fortune 500 companies. We have a long way to go, and we have a lot of issues to address. But today, it is my pleasure to introduce one woman who has made history in her own right and in her own time. And that is Kerry Healy, who was elected Lieutenant Governor of Massachusetts just last year. She is one of only four women who have held statewide office in Massachusetts in nearly four centuries. 
Lieutenant Governor Healy brings extensive public policy experience and academic credentials to the Romney administration. For nearly a decade, she has worked as a consultant for APPS Associates in Cambridge in the fields of law and public safety. In this capacity, she conducted research for the U.S. Department of Justice in the areas of child abuse and neglect, domestic violence, gang violence, victim and witness intimidation, and the prosecution of drug crimes. Before her election as Lieutenant Governor, Ms. Healy served as chair of the Massachusetts Republican Party, where she restored party finances and energized the grassroots activists. Lieutenant Governor Healy resides in Beverly and has a strong commitment to her community. She has served on the foundation board of North Shore Community College. She's co-chaired the Beverly United Way campaign in 2001 and has served on the Friends Board of Beverly Hospital. A strong believer in literacy and learning, Lieutenant Governor Healy also co-chaired a campaign to rebuild her city's library, raising more than $1 million in private funds and grants. She is the author of four books and numerous articles, and in addition, she has been a member of the faculties at both Endicott College and the University of Massachusetts at Lowell. She received her bachelor's degree from Harvard and her PhD in political science and law from Trinity College in Dublin, Ireland. And we are delighted that she is here with us today, and it gives me great pleasure to welcome her to the podium. Thank you, Joanne. I think you, uh, you just, just skipped ahead and gave my whole speech. So, so I think we're done here. I'm glad that at least one person here is going to agree with what I have to say. Because I was, uh, it's a great honor to have been asked to speak to all of you today. And the point that I wanted to make was one that Joanne touched on quickly which was that there is this notion of women's issues. And I know all morning you've been talking now about how to get people out to run and how to encourage women to run. I'd like to talk a little bit about maybe what their platforms would be and what kind of issues we need to be talking about and working on as women. And um, I was given the opportunity to choose any topic I wanted today, and I want to thank you for, the, uh, for that. But, uh, and I, I thought that this is one where perhaps we're at a, a critical juncture, that at the end of the, the last century, perhaps we need to reconsider whether or not there really are women's issues, per se, even though so much of our lives have been organized around working for these particular issues that we all recognize as being extremely important and very critical to us personally, and yet are we in fact at this point hobbling our efforts to move forward and to w move women forward as activists by limiting our scope to what might be considered traditionally women's issues. And I think all of us know what we're talking about when we say women's issues. It's been defined for us by the press. There's obviously choice, and there's health care, and there's education, daycare, domestic violence. I chair the uh, Governor's Commission on Sexual and Domestic Violence. That's something that uh, women have traditionally championed. And then there are issues that are traditionally men's issues. And maybe it's important, more important for us to talk about what some of those issues are. When you do polls, and the polls will always show up a gender difference, this so-called gender gap that you come up with when women are saying why they vote for one candidate or not another candidate. Men will always say they're choosing their candidates because of jobs, the economy, taxes, law and order, and homeland security. And women, by and large, will choose their candidates based on public education, health care, and some of the other issues we were just talking about. Um, and this is real. This is not a perceived gender gap. By and large, there really is that thinking out there that women and men choose their candidates a little bit differently. And so that's going to handicap women's can women who only espouse certain particular interests, certain issues, uh, it's going to limit the ability that they're going to have to reach out and reach out to that male voting public as well. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about that. And my career has been one where I've been coming more from the other side. Uh, like Joanne, I, I ended up in criminology. I didn't mean to be a criminologist. It just happened. I needed a job. 
And I, the job that I was qualified to do happened to be at Apt Associates, and Apt Associates said, you have three months to write a book on drug paraphernalia law. Would you like that job? And I, uh, I needed to pay the bills, so I said, yes, absolutely. I will become the national expert on drug paraphernalia. And so there I went uh, into my career in criminal justice, and it, and it, and it kind of built from there. Um, during those years, during the late 80s, uh, the big topics were drug crime, gang violence, gang intimidation, and those were the topics that I really uh, began with. Those were where I started to build my reputation, and I can tell you that those were all male-dominated fields at that time. Conference after conference, I'd go on uh, having to do with gang crime. I would be the only woman in the room. Then later on, during the Clinton administration, the Justice Department started looking at different aspects of crime as well. Some of the things, again, that Joanne mentioned in my introduction, uh, the if impact of batterer treatment or intervention on battering. Uh, and, you know, does it work? Does it not work? How about the impact of child abuse on future criminality? Is there anything we can do to help children who've been abused to make sure that their lives still turn out well? What can we do to prevent child abuse and neglect? Should we consider it more of a crime or more of a social issue, or is it both? And so what, was, what changed for me in the 1990s was that I went from being in a career where every time I went to work it was a room full of men to I went to, I, I started walking into rooms that had substantial numbers of women. And the women brought new things to the table. Even though we were talking about criminal justice issues, their home careers in traditionally female career paths in education, in health care, in social work and human services brought a depth of understanding and a multidisciplinary approach to criminal justice that had been lacking when we had been having discussions around, for example, drug abuse and gang violence earlier in that decade because there were not women at the table who had that kind of experience. Um, at the same time, and, and again, in my introduction, you heard that I'd done a lot of work in my community or uh, voluntary efforts. I'm sure that women traditionally have been drawn into that kind of world. I know my mother pounded it through me that the most important thing that you could do was to volunteer, to give back. It didn't matter how poor you were. It didn't matter how bad your own life was. The best thing you could do to keep everything in perspective was to go out and help somebody else because that would give you that immediate sense, not only the satisfaction of helping somebody else, but that real perspective that your problems are just one thing that's going on in the world and you re need to really understand what's going on with other people's lives who are have, having serious problems. Um, so like many women, I went out and I did both traditional uh, volunteer work like Working, I, had a, I was with a mother's group that would do some work. I served on friends boards, as you mentioned, for hospitals and education institutions, but also with more progressive uh, social movements like the World YWCA. I had the opportunity to serve on their um, delegation to the United Nations NGO Assembly. Now, I don't know if you're aware that these things exist, but at the United Nations, in addition to all of the diplomats that get together and talk, representatives from all the NGOs, all the non-governmental organizations around the world also get together to talk about their issues. So there's UNICEF and there's um, all of these, uh, Amnesty International, all the, all the big nonprofits that you think of that do international work get together. And I had the opportunity to be on the delegation of the World YWCA. And one of the things that struck me about the YWCA at the local level, at the um, national level, and our, our uh, level that right there in New York where I was on the board, was that it didn't differ very much. The types of issues that they were involved with didn't differ very much than the tr those that were uh, being espoused by the more traditional women's groups, the mother's groups, the friends groups, and so forth. Everyone was working on uh, choice, on helping teen mothers, on helping homeless uh, mothers who'd been abused and their children, all very good work, but it was all very similar work. No matter where you were in the political spectrum, no matter where you were, why you were volunteering, it was all very similar. Even though sometimes the uh, 
the espoused purpose of the organizations might be very different. For example, the wise uh, espoused mission is to promote the equality of women and to eliminate racism by any means necessary. Well, that's going to be a little bit more uh, progressive, if you will, than uh, perhaps the local mothers group. But they still were working on the same issues. They were women's issues, and we were working on them the same way. Now, when I went to the UN, though, we got to talk about what was happening with women in other countries and how we could help women in other countries get up to what we perceive to be the level that we enjoy here in the United States. And when we did that, I think we projected a lot of those values, our values, onto the women in other countries. We assumed that they'd want help with, oh, you know, domestic violence, uh, with some of the issues that they have about bodily integrity, certainly, you know, health care issues, contraception issues. We were, you know, very concerned that we wanted to get women into groups to start talking about their problems as women. And when the Eastern Bloc countries opened up, we thought this was a very exciting opportunity for the YWCA to try to move in and reorganize there and try to spread some of the, uh, the word about uh, our social movement there in, in the Eastern Bloc countries. And in the Ukraine, there was this one area that was just plagued with alcoholism and domestic violence and child abuse and all these really terrible problems. And we had a wonderful director there who was trying to organize the women to come to groups and talk about, you know, let's talk about these very important uh, women's issues. And they kept putting her off. They kept saying, no, 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 we're too busy. We, we really, you know, yes, we understand this is a problem that my husband gets drunk and comes home and beats me, but I don't really want to talk about it right now. I'm, I have things that I need to do. And the more she, they, she talked to these women, the more they kept saying one thing. We'd like a mangle, please. A mangle. Now, does anyone here know what a mangle is? And a big, a big ironing thing. It's a huge uh, press, if you will, um, where they actually have a lot of linen sheets, apparently, and linen everything there in this part of the Ukraine. And so ironing was a big part of their life, and it really took up too much of their time. And what they needed was a mangle. And what they finally just kept arguing for this mangle. And we kept thinking, oh, my gosh, you know, they, they just don't get it. They're not getting it. Um, but eventually Geneva got weak and gave them, like, a $100,000 mangle. It was a huge mangle. And so what occurred was the women started to come together, and they organized uh, a little business of pressing everybody's sheets and doing everybody's laundry. And in the process, the women came and they started sitting around and they had a little bit more time because they weren't ironing all day. And they were, had a little bit of money because they had this business going. And sooner than later, they started saying, you know what, we all have the same problems. You know what, all of our husbands are drunk and abusive. You know what, all of, you know, we all share these issues. You know what, there's child abuse here. We need to deal with this. And they started organizing the groups that we'd wanted them to organize in the, future, in, in the first place, but they weren't ready for that. And again and again around the world, whether it was in Africa or Asia or in the Eastern Bloc, women taught us that economic power was the first thing that women needed to succeed. And that after you had economic power, everything else flowed. It wasn't a question of, I need health care. They could buy health care. It wasn't a question of I need bodily integrity. They could walk away from that abusive relationship and not suffer. So there are ways, I think, of thinking about women's issues that are slightly different and that maybe we need to learn from elsewhere in the world and step back and say all these, all these issues are integrated for us. There really aren't, as Joanne said, any women's issues. But if I had to say what women's issues should be moving forward. If we had to focus on something, I would say women should focus on the economy. Women should focus on job creation and on financial equality to men. And that when we have that, then we will be able to get everything else on our agenda. Everything else that we're working for, from education to health care to bodily integrity, all of these things will follow from economic power. And we need to make sure that our candidates understand that they can't just be talking about things that half our population, our men, are not going to be listening to or not be putting value on. We need to be talking about the economy. We need to be talking about how to get jobs going here again in Massachusetts. And when we do that, 
When we do that, we'll become part of the mainstream, we will gain power, and we will be able to elect people who represent our needs and our concerns. So that's my message for today. <laughs> Thank you. I want to thank Lieutenant Governor Kerry Healy for joining us today for several reasons. One, we were very happy that Lieutenant Governor Healy is on our honorary committee, so thank you for being part of that. Your name and your presence here says to this group that you, as a senior, as the most prominent woman elected official in Massachusetts, the home state of the summit, also value what we're doing here today, so I thank you for that communication by being on our honorary committee. But even more important, I think that many women who go into politics go into politics for the issues, that the issues, we talked this morning about the passion that's necessary, and I think you're very, very good at putting forth to us the need to have the economy, economic sustainability and, and uh, power that is so clearly linked to politics, if only because with money, women can also donate to electoral campaigns. So, um, so thank you so much, and good luck for the rest of your uh, term.